everyone. Uh, it's great to have each of you to join us on this second morning of our AEC virtual camp meeting. On behalf of our president, Elder Henry J. Fordham, uh, Vice President of Administration, Elder Pete Palmer, and uh, Vice President of Finance, uh, Elder Lawrence Martin, uh, I extend to each of you a warm and very cordial welcome to this virtual mountaintop experience. We want to remind you that starting on tomorrow, we will be hosting three meals a day. Uh, there will be not only our morning service, 
but there will be a 12 noon service and then of course our evening service and those services will run those three offerings will run Monday through Friday beginning tomorrow again a very warm and cordial welcome to each of you may God richly bless us as we prepare for the spiritual manner today Errol Theodore Stoddart graduated with honors from Oakwood College in 1984 with a double major in theology and communications and received his Master's of Divinity degree from the Andrews University Seminary in 1986. He is also a Doctor of Ministry graduate from Carolina University of Theology with a concentration in worship and liturgy. Pastor Stoddart officially began his ministry in August of 1986 when he was called by the Allegheny East Conference to serve as the associate pastor of the DuPont Park Church in Washington, D.C., where he served until January 1st of 1988. Since that time, he has served as the pastor of the Miracle Temple and First Maranatha SDA Churches in Baltimore, Maryland, First Church of Teaneck, New Jersey, and New Life of Gaithersburg, Maryland, where a multi-million dollar facility was built to the glory of God. His last two pastorates include the Ephesus Seventh-day Adventist Church in Richmond, Virginia, and Miracle Temple SDA Church in Baltimore, Maryland. He is the author of two books, The Silent Shout, A Guide for Biblical Praise and Worship, and The Cycle of Worship. He is the founder and speaker of two television ministries, Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth and Richmond Family Focus. Dr. Stoddard is an international speaker, traveling to Africa, Europe, and the Caribbean. He is married to his wife, Vernay, who holds an MBA from Johns Hopkins University. She is also the founder of WINGS, providing etiquette training for young girls ages 5 through 17. Pastor Stoddard has found great strength in Psalm 121, which has been his text of strength throughout his life, especially in times of crisis including the sudden death of his father in 1986 and the murder of his brother in 1996. The psalm says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth, and even forevermore. Your speaker today, Pastor Errol Stoddard. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we have come this morning because we need a word from you. We cannot navigate life without your guidance. And so today, Heavenly Father, we come asking for grace to order our steps in harmony with your will. We come today, Heavenly Father, asking for wisdom to anoint our speech and all of our engagements with others today. We come, Heavenly Father, asking for strength to meet today's untried challenges. We come today, Heavenly Father, asking for kindness to anoint our lips, that with all we encounter today, we will be able to lift their burdens and to point them to our Lord and Savior. We've come today, Heavenly Father, asking for power to represent you aright. We come today, Heavenly Father, asking for your hand to keep us today. We want to lift up before you our leadership, not only of the Allegheny East Conference, but also the leadership of the Columbia Union, the North American Division, the General Conference, and all of the 13 World Divisions. We lift up before you, Heavenly Father, world leaders who have the sacred task of letting justice roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. We want to ask a very special blessing upon the Allegheny East Conference membership today. And we want to ask your blessings upon your work. Now, Heavenly Father, thy manservant, Dr. E.T. Stardard, has been chosen to bring the word this morning. 
We ask that you would anoint him afresh, that our cups will not only be filled, but run over with the necessary blessings and strength that we need for today. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, everybody. Lift your hands and give God the best sacrifice of praise that you have. Come on, everybody. Let's praise the Lord. We offer the sacrifice of praise. We lift up our hands and we bless your name. Glory and honor, wisdom and strength. Everybody, come praise the Lord. Everybody, come praise the Lord. We offer and we lift up our hands. To bless your name, giving glory, wisdom. Oh, everybody, everybody, come. Come on and say, for the Lord is holy. Yes, for the Lord is holy. Yes, the Lord is holy, holy and just. Come on, everybody. Come on and praise the Lord, everybody come. Oh, this is a good time to praise the Lord. Come on and sing it with me. We offer our best sacrifice of praise to the Lord. Every nation, tongue, and people. Ooh, we offer you praise. And we lift up our hands to bless you, giving glory. And I our nurse strength, everybody, come praise the Lord. Everybody, come. come oh, yes, for the Lord is holy. Hey, for you alone are holy. I call you holy. Yes, the Lord is holy. Holy and just. Come on, everybody. Oh, yeah. Praise the Lord with me. Come on and praise Him, for the Lord is worthy. Oh, for you alone not worthy. Oh yes, for the Lord is worthy, worthy and just. Come on, everybody, and praise the Lord with me. Ooh, yeah. Tell Him we lift up our hands. To bless and we give of ourselves to you, oh Lord. We lift, we lift up our voice in highest praise. Hallelujah, glory to you, hallelujah. We want to bless your name from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same. We love to praise your name. Oh. To the Lord, for He is good, for He is great. We want to bless His name. Everybody, come praise, just praise the Lord with me. Ooh, yeah. Come on, everybody, you come on. Every nation, kingdom, tongue, and people, let's praise Him. Ooh. Come on, everybody. Come on, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Put a praise right here, everybody. Let's say, come praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We bless God, everyone, for this opportunity to share the word of God with the body of Christ, the Alleghenies Conference family, and to our extended family members beyond the circumference of the Alleghenies Conference territory. I want to express my appreciation to our president of Fordham for this opportunity to share the word of God and uh, to the entire planning committee. And what a wonderful theme that has been chosen, undefeated. 
Oh, my goodness. Uh, we've been hearing and we will continue to hear sermons that inspire and encourage us to grow in our walk with God. And so I, I, I've entitled our message for today, Raise Your Resilience. Raise Your Resilience. I want to come to you from the book of 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. The Bible says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Raise your resilience. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you so much today for the opportunity to share your word. And all of us, God, have been buffeted by negative news. Coronavirus has held many of us captives. We have been terrorized by this awful pandemic. But today we declare in the name of Jesus that in spite of all that we've been through, in spite of the challenges we've had to face, we are determined by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to raise the level of our resilience. And we thank you that it shall come to pass in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. I, I will tell you this. I will tell you this. I, I am concerned today that it appears to me, it just appears to me that this generation is not as mentally strong as previous generations. I'm going to say that again. It appears to me that this age, this generation, is not as mentally tough as previous generations. I, you know, we're here now on the campus of Allegheny East Conference, and, and right beside us here is the Manor House. The Manor House it, it was a part of the Underground Railroad, uh, and, 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 and slaves escaping the South would find refuge here along that railroad. Uh, the, the Underground Railroad was a, was a powerful instrument in the emancipation, in the liberation of those who were trying to escape slavery. And in my mind's eye, I visualize Harriet Tubman walking on these grounds and, and leading slaves from Southern Maryland through Pennsylvania all the way up to upstate New York, to freedom land. I've often imagined that journey and what it took for someone to walk miles from Southern Maryland or Virginia all the way to Pennsylvania and then from Pennsylvania all the way up to New York. I've, 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 I've driven the journey and, and I've imagined uh, and you've done the journey. Many of you who live in the Tidewater area, you know it takes about six hours. It's, it's just about 300 miles plus miles from Virginia to Allegheny's Conference Campground. Imagine now uh, another 300 miles to upstate New York. And imagine having to walk that distance. God. It, they had to have a mindset. A toughness a resilience to make that arduous journey. I don't know if I could make that journey. Uh, you know, I hear people many times talk about if I was living during the days of slavery, I would do thus and so. And the truth of the matter is many of us wimp out at the slightest presentation of adversity. Many of us have no staying power. We don't have the drive, the gumption, the unction to function and do what they did in that day. I, I think about, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Civil War buff, and, and I think about uh, General Sherman. Sherman marching his 60 to 80,000 troops across the Southland, marching from Tennessee and marching across Georgia, burning the city of Atlanta all the way out to Savannah, then coming up the coastline to Charleston, and, and, and ultimately uh, uh, they came 
and they burnt everything along the way. Of course, you know history will tell you that the, the leaders of the city of Savannah came out and made a deal with Sherman. But I can, I can visualize that drive. Imagine driving across Tennessee, across Georgia, all the way to the coast, coming up Charleston. Come on, somebody. Then all the way up towards Charlotte, North Carolina. That's the journey they marched. You had to be tough. And I dare suggest, and I think I'm right, that this generation today, <laughs> they need to understand what resilience looks like. I, I, I hear young people complain about how hard and difficult it is for them to do their homework today when, when really we're living in the era of Google. Come on, somebody. We can say, we can say, Siri, show me, come on, on the map. Siri, give me directions to. Siri, call. You don't even have to dial the number. Just tell Siri and Siri will call for you. This is a different age. <laughs> Think about it for a minute. What it took for our forefathers to get to where they had to get. The sacrifice. They had to be resilient. Back in the day when we were doing homework, you know, we, we had to go to the library or we had to get an Encyclopedia Britannica and we had to take footnotes on two by four cards. Now we just Google it, cut and paste. Come on, somebody. That's where we are today. <laughs> so, so young people, I don't even want to hear your complaints about how difficult homework is. <laughs> As your grandma would say, you ain't seen hard yet. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Type in the chat. Type in the chat right now. I've been lazy, if you have been lazy. But, but we're raising our resilience. We're raising our resilience. Come on, somebody. We're getting tougher and tougher. Uh, we are maximizing our capacity. Uh, imagine, if you will, back in the day, listen, back in the day, you remember what it was when you had to make a phone call? You had, a, you had, a, you had to dial and dial and dial. You had a rotary phone. Uh, and, and if you didn't have a phone in your house, you had to go to the phone booth. Now, pick up your cell phone. You can call anybody in the world once you've downloaded WhatsApp. Come on. It's a new age. It's a new day. Ladies and gentlemen, we have every convenience at our fingertips. And yet, and yet, the suicide rate is higher now than ever before. People are quitting and giving up. People are quitting because of what people say about them on social media. That's a whole new phenomenon, ladies and gentlemen. People are taking their lives because of the stresses of life. In an age of so many conveniences, many of us are not where our forefathers were with their drive and grit and determination. Type in the chat right now. I want to build my resilience. I'm becoming more resilient. Come on. Come on. Type in the chat right now. Time to get tough. Come on, somebody. Time to step up. What is resilience? Think about resilience for a minute. What, what exactly is resilience? I want, you, I want you to think about a basketball. Uh, what happens when you slam that ball on the ground? The basketball is filled with air and it just bounces back. The basketball is resilient because it has something on the inside that gives it bounce come on come on i just said a word <laughs> i want somebody to type in the chat right now i got that bounce i got that bounce because i got something within me the harder you throw it down on the ground the higher it bounces back it doesn't flatten out because it is resilient now, truth be told, there are many of us who have experienced challenges in life that puts us in a hard place. I recently read of the ACES study. The ACES study is a study done by Kaiser Permanente back in the 90s. And the ACES study really is a study of what they call adverse childhood experiences. That's what the ACES study 
represents. Adverse childhood experiences. And, 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 and uh, what they did in the study, they were looking for how does trauma affect your health? How does trauma and adverse childhood experiences between the ages of 0 to 17, how do these experiences affect your outcome? And so what they found, ladies and gentlemen, they found that people exposed to violence and abuse or neglect, those who grew up with violence in their homes or in their community, those who had family members that died of a violent attack or died by suicide, those who grew up in environments where uh, they did not have a sense of safety, they did not have a sense of stability, they grew up in a household where there was substance abuse or mental health issues or instability uh, due to parental separation or household members being in jail. And they found uh, that in the ACEs study, Chronic diseases, mental illness in adulthood is linked to what happened to you when you were a child. Now, I will tell you this. Even as an adult, I remember some of the things clearly that happened to me as a child. And I've had dreams for years of a woman screaming in my head. And, and I've dreamt these dreams for years over and over and over again. And over again. And what the ACEs study revealed, ladies and gentlemen, what the ACEs study revealed is that people suffer from depression today based on prolonged exposure to trauma in childhood. I'm talking to somebody today. I'm talking to somebody today. Somebody under the sound of my voice. You've been exposed to long-term trauma. And you feel broken by it. My God, my God, my God. Because the research shows that life expectancy is lowered based on the ACEs study. Come on. People who have these ACEs and multiply ACEs have higher rates of high blood pressure and diabetes and heart disease. Come on, somebody. Uh, 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 they, the ACEs have... Uh, Long-term implications for what we call SDOH or social determinants of health. ACEs impact your life in real time. Real life. Oh God. So yes, we have been through trauma. And, and what the studies reveal, ladies and gentlemen, is that there's a difference in how people respond to prolonged trauma. As opposed to how they respond to intermittent trauma or adversity. So, so just like your muscles. Imagine, imagine you are working out. You're working out. If you're trying to build muscles, they tell you don't work the same muscles every day. You got to stress and release. So you do chest today. You don't do chest tomorrow. You got to wait a couple of days to do chest again. That's how you build the layers on your muscles. But if you are traumatized every day, if your muscles are traumatized every day, it may create long-term damage. God, have mercy. I'm saying something to you today. And so many of us, many of us have been exposed to long-term trauma, but most of us have been exposed to intermittent trauma challenges that come our way ah that affect our lives that affect our thinking but i heard somebody say what doesn't kill you makes you stronger come on somebody if it didn't kill you it'll make you stronger uh, uh. and you gotta have that mindset because ultimately we cannot reverse the hands of time and go back in time to undo what has already been done. We've got to take it from where we are and we've got to determine that from henceforth I've got a made up mind that I'm going to grow my resilience. That I'm going to fight the good fight of faith. That I'm going to trust God with where I am. And help him to give me the strength to, to mentally deal with what I have been through. Because all of us have been through something. 
if you have pigmentation like me, you've been through something. Come on, somebody. Right now, we know what happened with George Floyd. And, and we know what happened with Breonna Taylor. But more than that, we know what happened back in Tulsa, Oklahoma. President Biden spoke about that just recently, a hundred years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, what we are being told is that trauma, trauma ha can have such a psychological effect that it passes on generationally. So many of us with pigmentation like mine are dealing with generational trauma but I declare in the name of Jesus that I'm building my resilience I said I'm building my resilience uh, in spite of what I've been through I'm getting better and I'm getting stronger I heard somebody say praise God I don't look like what I've been through Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. I don't look like what I've been through. I love the way the Apostle Paul speaks in terms of his sense of what resilience looks like. Apostle Paul, writing in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 9, he's in this space now where, where he has this, what I call this unmatched perspective God mm, mm. what do you mean pastor Paul is writing to people who rejected his authority as an apostle they have accepted the leadership authority and spiritual directives of false apostles and teachers and so Paul writes to remind the church in Corinth of who he is and what he has endured that qualifies him to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. And here's essentially what Paul is saying in these verses. He's saying in these verses. He, he says in these verses. He says you listen to those guys who brag about who they are. And what they have done. Now let me review my resume with you. Let me tell you about who I am. And what qualifies me to be an apostle. This is what Paul says. He says. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 9 uh, and, and going down verse 18 on down he says since many of you are boasting in the way of the world and in the way the world does I too will boast you gladly put up with fools since you are so wise in fact you even put up with anyone who enslaves you or exploits you or takes advantage of you or puts on airs or slaps you in your face to my shame I admit that we were too weak to do that. Paul says, I didn't do anything like that. Now, the next verse, he says, huh, whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I'm speaking as a fool now, I dare to boast about that too. Here he goes. He starts to brag now. Paul says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Come on. He says, are they Abraham's descendants? Guess what? So am I. Uh, uh, uh. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind for talking like this. But then he says, I am more. I have worked harder. Been in prison more frequently. Been flogged more severely. Been exposed to death again and again. And then Paul gets down and dirty. He begins to spell out all the stuff that he has been through. Now, as I read the text, it, it, it made sense to me that Paul bragged about his heritage and his lineage. I, I, I appreciate the fact that he could talk about who he is, that qualifies him and grants him apostolic authority. But then he detours to literally brag about his pain, Jesus, his suffering. Verse 24, he says, <laughs> he says, five times I received of the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Lord, have mercy. Mm. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. 
I spent a night and a day on the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from the rivers, dangers from bandits, dangers from my fellow Jews, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the country, danger at sea, danger from false brethren. I have labored and toiled, and I've often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst, but often, uh, often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. My God, my God, my God. Talk about tough. I, I, I'm not going to lie. I would have quit after the first lash. Not, I wouldn't have waited for 39. Because in that day, the Talmud, the, the Jewish writers say that the way you were flogged, they would take you and tie you to a pole. They would strip your back. And the person that was going to whoop you would stand on a stool. Y'all not listening to me. And with the cats of nines, uh, they would come down on your bare back. Now, 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 I've been whooped before. Come on, I, I, anybody been whooped before? Just, just type in the chat, me too. <laughs> Don't tell the whole story. Just say, me too. Come on, come on, come on. Matter of fact, matter of fact, I've been whooped many times. Not, not, not spanked. Because spanking is just a little, you know, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about whooped. <laughs> with mechanisms, y'all not hearing me. I have been whooped, but, but it was nothing compared to what Paul endured. But, but not only did they tie you and strip your clothes and whoop you on your back, but then they, tie, they turn you around and lay you with your bare chest and you get whooped on your back and on your chest. The Jews being so punctilious, ensured that it was 39. Even though Deuteronomy talks about 40, they wanted to be punctilious and not even risk getting more than 40. Paul received those lashes five times. Lord have mercy. He was beaten because he was preaching the gospel, but he didn't quit. He didn't turn in his ministerial credentials. But not only was he beaten five times, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get somebody to build some resilience here. I'm trying to help you to understand you've got to be resilient in spite of the trauma you've been through. You've got to make up your mind right now that I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to throw in the towel. I'm not giving up in the name of Jesus. Paul says, beaten with rods three times. I've been pelted with stones three times. I've been in a shipwreck. Mm. Spent a night and a day on the sea, constantly on the move, surrounded by dangers in the river, by bandits from the Jews, from the Gentiles in the city, in the country, on the ocean, from false brethren. Ladies and gentlemen, most of us, including me, would have quit a long time ago. You got to understand if a man is getting 39 lashes, Times five times, uh, that's two, just around 200 lashes. But he didn't quit. Oh, that's tough. That is resilient. They'd whip him and he'd go back to preach. Come on, somebody. They'd whip him again and he'd go back to preach. Mm, mm, mm. Because he was resilient. Here's, here's what I'm saying to you. Build your resilience. What am I talking about? Psychology Today did an article written by Dr. Janice uh, Villahill. Uh, and she talks about what is resilience. Hear me today. Hear me. Hear me. She says adversity is a fact of life. Resilience is that ineffable quality that allows some people to be knocked down by life and come back at least as strong as before. Rather than letting difficulties or failure overcome them and drain their resolve, they find a way to rise. I heard somebody say, and still I rise. 
Psychologists have identified some of the factors that make a person more resilient. And here are some of the factors. It, whatever you're doing, stop right now and listen to me. What are the factors that build resilience? Number one, a positive attitude. Being optimistic. The ability to regulate your emotions. The ability to see failure as a form of helpful feedback. So just because you failed doesn't mean the game is over. Come on, somebody. Mm, mm. Failure is a lesson life is trying to teach you. Learn from it and get back in the game. Get back on the road. Get back in the fight. Come on, somebody. Research shows that optimism helps to blunt the impact of stress on the body and on the mind in the wake of destructive experiences. So yes, we have been through COVID, but I declare in the name of Jesus, uh, trouble won't last always. Uh, hallelujah. COVID has an end in view. Uh, it's got to get better in the name of Jesus. Uh, thank you, God. So research shows that optimism helps to blunt the impact of stress on the mind and body in the wake of disturbing experiences. And that gives people access to their own cognitive resources, enabling cool headed analysis of what might have gone wrong and consideration of behavioral paths that might be more productive. Here's what she says. She says, resilience is not a magical quality. It takes real mental work to transcend hardship. But even after misfortune, resilient people are able to change course and move towards achieving their goals. There's growing evidence that the elements of resilience can be cultivated. Oh my God, I just said a word. There's growing evidence that the elements of resilience can be cultivated. Mm, 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 mm. So, so in the study, hear me now. I'm getting a little deep, but stay with me. Stay with me. You got you to stay with me. Hear me. In the study of neuroplasticity, this is the study of how to retrain your brain. Mm, mm. They are finding that you can literally... In the study of neuroplasticity, they are finding that you can literally retrain your brain despite your age. Oh, God, I'm feeling good right now. That means that although I'm 50 plus with the rest of us, I can learn new things. Who said you can't te or teach old dogs uh, new tricks? I'm learning some new stuff. I'm learning how to practice Resilience. I'm learning how to retrain my brain. And they tell us that through the practice of proper breathing, through the practice of meditation, through the practice of spirituality like prayer, whoo, through the practice of claiming the promises of God and staying focused on what God said about you. Come on, somebody. I'm more than a conqueror. Through him that loves me. Can I get a witness somebody? Through feeding your brain differently. By what you listen to. And by what you repeat. You can literally build resilience. Oh God. It's not over. Oh thank you. It's not over. The game is not over. Just because you're old. Doesn't mean you're over the hill. Come on somebody. I, I heard somebody say that 60 is the new 40. I receive that in the name of Jesus. Uh, uh, so, so watch this. Watch this. What this is telling me. If resilience can be cultivated. What it's telling me. Is that a person with a negative attitude. Can learn to develop a positive attitude. A person who is a doubter, can learn to develop faith. And remember, your mind is like a farmer's field. A farmer's field, if left uncultivated, will grow weeds. God. But if cultivated, if tended, if nurtured, if positive seeds are sown, positive fruit and grains will grow. 
I've often reminded people that you see the seed you sow is the plant that will grow. Say it with me. The seed you sow is the plant that will grow. And you spur on the growth of that plant, of that tree, by watering it or fertilizing it with, with the proper nutrients so it'll grow in the right direction. Can I get a witness, somebody? Can I get a witness, somebody? I, I want you to type in the chat right now. I'm sowing good seeds and I'm watering it with prayer. I'm watering it with the promises of God. I'm watering it by what I listen to. Come on, somebody. I'm watering it by, by my thought life. I'm watering it by meditation. I'm watering it by forcing myself to redirect my thoughts to, towards that which is healthy and that which elevates. I will not complain. I will not dwell on the negative because I'm filled with love. I'm filled with grace. I'm filled with peace. I'm filled with joy. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. Somebody ought to praise him in your kitchen right now. Somebody ought to praise him in your living room right now. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. I got to bring this home. I got to bring this home, but I got to give this to you. According to Andrew Newberg, MD, and Mark Robert Wallman, two researchers and doctors, they wrote a book called Words Can Tra Words, hear me, Words Can Change Your Brain. Oh God, hear me today. I'm giving you something. I'm giving words can change your brain. And this is what they write in the book. A single word has the power to influence the expression of genes that regulate physical and emotional stress. Oh God. Uh. Positive words like peace and love can alter the expression of genes, strengthening areas in our frontal lobes and promoting the cognitive function of the brain. That ought to give you something to do every day when you get up. When you get up every morning, you ought to say in the name of Jesus, my heart is filled with love. My heart is filled with joy. My heart is filled with peace. My heart is filled with hope. My heart is full of goodness. My heart is full of gratitude. My heart is full of thanks. Every day when you get up, you ought to alter the gene expression in your brain by the words that you use. Oh God. This is what they say. According to the authors, using the right words can transform our reality. By holding a positive, optimistic word in your mind, you stimulate frontal lobe activity. This area includes specific language center that connect directly to the motor cortex responsible for moving you into action. And as our research has shown, the longer you concentrate on positive words, the, the more you begin to affect other areas of your brain. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. So today I declare I am powerful. I am loving. I am kind. I'm graceful. I'm confident. I'm positive. I'm peaceful. I'm hopeful. I'm more than a conqueror through him that loves me. I'm capable. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Uh, 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 the original text we started with, the Bible says, Paul says, God has not given us a spirit of fear. Cross that off your table. I'm not walking around the Greek word for, for, for bear am I, for bear am I. And, and you know, fear has positive, respectful fear. That's not what Paul is talking about. He's talking about dread, panic, terror, intimidation, stuff that stress you out. God did not give you a spirit of fear, but he's given us, hallelujah, power. Love and a sound mind. First John 1 18, the Bible says, There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear breeds torment. God did not give us fear, God gave us the antidote to fear, which is love. God's love says, I love you no matter who you are, 
No matter how messed up you are, ladies and gentlemen, I work as a community health care chaplain in Newark, New Jersey. And every now and then I see a human being that makes you look twice because they are deep in degradation, life messed up, hair unkept, clothing tattered. But in the name of Jesus, God declares that's a person that I love. That's a human being that God still loves. So don't you dare turn your nose up on that homeless man just because uh, his life looks ripped apart by addiction and, and loss and, and because the aces uh, have wrecked his soul. You don't know their story, but the God that we serve declares, uh, I love you with an everlasting love. That's the love of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. God still loves you through your addiction. God still loves you. <clears throat> when your life is filled with this fear, it robs you of peace. It increases your stress. It heightens your worry. Ah, but God said, I did not give that to you. But I've given you love and power and a sound mind. When you're rooted in love... You have solid ground. So I say to you today, my friends, walk in the love of God. Live in love. Talk in love. Work in love. Serve in love. Stand in love. Trust in God's love. Even when you've messed up, he still loves you. When you're working through your addiction and through your alcoholism, he still loves you. Ah, oh, remove the fear and worry because your daddy still loves you. So today I declare I'm filled with love. I'm filled with joy. I'm filled with peace. Meditate on these words. Repeat these words. There is a reason why the Apostle Paul writes. Uh, uh, he says, he says, the fruit of the spirit is love. And the first byproduct of love, joy. Then peace. Because God knew that we needed to hear these words uh, every single day. My heart is filled with love. My mind will is filled with love. So Paul says, God did not give us the spirit of fear, but of love that he gave us the spirit of power. Power to take on the challenges and win. Power to overcome the aces. Power to take authority over our mind. Power to speak things into existence. Power to declare those things that are not as though they were. Power to have faith. Power to speak life. Power to transform. Power to overcome. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. So God gives us a spirit of love and power and a sound mind. For he's a mind regulator and a heart fixer. Somebody ought to say amen. So you ought to declare fear will not have dominion over me. Worry will not have dominion over me. Stress will not have dominion over me. But love will have dominion over me. Joy will have dominion over me. Peace will have dominion over me. Ah, how COVID thought it had me. But bless God, I'm still here. I shall live and not die. I will survive. I will make it. All oh, things did get a little a little tougher the journey did get a little rough but bless god i'm still here almost lost my way but i'm still here folks talked about me like a dog i'm still here somebody type in the chat right now i'm still here i am resilient have been beaten but I'm still undefeated. I refuse to give up. I will not throw in the towel. I refuse to let go. I refuse to stay down. I got spirit and I got spunk and I got grit and I got determination. I got passion and I got purpose and I've got 
pushing. I've got that something within me that holds the reins. Something within me that banishes pain. Something within me I cannot explain. I'm still here undefeated. Corona had me knocked down. But folks, I, I want to know I coughed and I shivered and I sweated through the night for five days. But until I rise, God saw me through. Satan had me bound, but I'm still here. Church buildings were closed, but declare I'm still here. My money got funny. I'm still here. Folks counted me out, but I'm still here. Enemies wrote me off, but I'm still here. Donald Trump, the one-term president, he ain't here, but I'm still here. I did get a little discouraged, but I'm still here. I was forsaken by some friends, but I'm still here. Oh, yes. I've seen the lightning flash, and I've heard the thunder roll. I felt Sins breakers dashing, trying to conquer my soul. But I heard the voice of Jesus telling me to still fight on. He promised, hallelujah, not to leave me. Thank you, Jesus. Never to leave me alone. I'm still here. And I ain't going nowhere because I'm resilient in the name of Jesus. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you, God, that like a basketball, we got bounds. Still, the air, the wind of the Holy Ghost in us to give us that bounce back. Yeah, I may have been down, but I ain't staying down. I'm, I'm coming back. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace and mercy that brought us through. Living each moment because of you. And we want to thank you Lord. That you're showing us how to grow. What you put in us. How to recite and stand on the promises. How to speak words of life over ourselves. Over our families. Over our children. Words of power. Words of transformation. Thank you Lord. That you're doing something mighty in our lives. We claim it. And we declare in the name of Jesus. I am resilient. And I'm undefeated. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. And amen. Amen. What a word we heard this morning. We just thank God for that word today. Let us go into a word of prayer. God, thank you so much for what you gave us on this morning. We needed it. Lord, let it be life changing in our lives. God, as we seek you and commune with you, this encampment meeting, encampment, God, we just want to be changed. So do what you need to do in us. Thank you for the word. Give us Holy Ghost power to obey your word. Thank you for what you will continue to do in your name. We pray. Amen. Attorney Jackson M. Doggett Jr. here, General Counsel and Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Director. We welcome you to Allegheny East Conference Virtual Camp Meeting, undefeated. Tell everyone, this is the place to get your spiritual uplift this summer. Allegheny East Conference Virtual Camp Meeting. The message has been reaching our community for over 50 years with articles designed to teach mental, physical, and spiritual growth. Do you get the message? The message has been used in hospitals and prisons to inspire change in the lives of our family, friends, and local community. Do you get the message? You can subscribe at messagemagazine.com slash subscribe. Do you give the message? Send the message to someone by visiting messagemagazine.com slash donate.
Thank you.
Alrighty, good morning and welcome to our second day of our camp meeting focusing on youth ministry. This morning we have another great speaker, Abraham Henry is going to bring a nice word to us. We want you to remember to share this with someone you love, share it with your friends, your neighbors and even those who you don't love. Just share it and make sure they get a piece of the pie. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your loving kindness and for your tender mercies. We are so grateful that we were able to worship with you 
with each other virtually. And we pray that as we're preparing to hear the word, that you would prepare our hearts and our minds, that you will prepare your manservant. Fill him with your spirit, oh God. Fill him with your love. I pray that you give him a word for us, that whatever it is that we need, um, whatever breakthroughs, whatever answers, whatever rebukes that we need, God, I pray that you would do it through him. Thank you so much for your many blessings. And we ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Hey, you ready to camp? You ready to camp? Listen, Master Guy is coming up soon, you know. That's right. That's so I right. hope you got your gear all packed and ready that's to right. go. We got Master Guide camping coming up. Actually, he's going to be up here. Yeah, one of them's going to be up okay, here. Okay, one's going to be up here. Okay, tell us what's going on with our Pathfinders, Adventurers, and um, and our Master Guides. First of all, let's just start with Master Guy because you know they are the they are the master guides. Listen, let's. I, we got to say, we got about maybe 30 pastors. Coming up. Mm -hmm. That's doing their master guides. They're coming out strong. Great classes. Great yes. um, discussions that we're having on there. But we still want everybody not only to be master guides, those who, who are not doing it anymore, um, we want them to be active again. Get active. Oh, yeah. Yes. Because okay. we have our, I mean, we got our kids. Our goal is always to save our kids. That's right. And if you have those tools, as a master guy, we want to make sure you use them. So if you're interested in being a part of the master guy club or just doing something in your church or even in our conference, just contact us and let us know so we could pass that information along. Yeah. Then we have our Pathfinders. Listen, as the, when the pandemic came through, we started a conference Pathfinder uh, club. club. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we did, wait, didn't we call it the Eagles? The Eagles, it's called that's the right. Eagles, that's right? right. The reason why we started that is because, you know, we got hit pretty hard over the pandemic. And, and, and we did lose some of our, our leaders. That's right, and some of our leaders, leaders also. So what we're doing right now is, uh, if you're not uh, in a Pathfinder club, just hit us online, right? Um, and uh, at www. Uh, AECYCM. A -E AECYCM. <laughs> AECYCM. Or visit AEC.org. Everything is there on the youth ministry page so that if your child is not connected, they're not connected to uh, a club right now, they could be co connected to the Allegheny East Eagles. The right. We're coming club to the end have. of the club year, but when we start back in September, if your church doesn't have it because of leadership issues or you just need somewhere to go, just call us, come on our website, and get connected. That's right. We also have similar with the Adventurer Club. Right. Share, share what we do with the Adventurer well, Club. Well, one thing I like about the even the Pathfinders have this too. The Adventurer Club, uh, they have certain churches that's coming together to mm -hmm. work as one club mm -hmm. during the pandemic. Very important. We're on Zoom. We're doing certain. They're doing certain activities. We still want you to be a part of. Even though it seems like we're coming out of the pandemic, we don't know what's going to happen. So what we're going to do, we're going to still continue the activities within the Adventurer Club. And um, if, if, if it has fallen off at your church because of it right now, we're still available to make sure that they move up in their classes. Definitely. We want to make sure our children you... are safe right. and we want to make sure that they have something to do. That's right. That's right. Listen, mm -hmm. you know, when I came first, the big talk was about Ashka. That's right. That's right. No, no That's we right. know we had some changes. And in a couple months, we're supposed to be going and do a site visit on the new place. But let's just share a little bit with the new the venue. New place. Okay. <laughs> for, All right. For, so for I Canterbury. remember coming in with, uh, I can remember Colorado, Pennsylvania back in the day. Now we're here at Oshkosh and they have picked a new venue, right. which is Gillette, Wyoming. 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 Gillette, Wyoming. Horses. All right. So <laughs> um, we're going to be out there next week. Pray for us as we go out there to pick our plot, pick oh, our spots, right. and, and we're going to be looking around at what's going on. But we want everyone to be a part of that. That means we need you to start saving, saving. now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Start saving up right now because it's on the other side of the world right. that we're going to at this time. But I'm, I'm grateful it's going to have a, it's going to have a great time. When do we go to Wyoming? Right. So we want everyone to be ready for that. But this is one thing I want everybody to know, that we have everything from Oshkosh now becomes collector's items. Right. All right. Allegheny East has always had the best hats, the best jackets, the yes. best all of that. And so what we're going to do at the end of this, we're going to show you a couple of pictures of the stuff that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can order them. We have quite a few that's left yeah, over that you can get. And we want to make sure that you have mm -hmm. We have the hats. The jackets. We, the jackets. We right. even have the visors. The visors, right. And we right. want to make sure that you have your Oshkosh gear so that when we go over into Gillette, we'll know that you have collector's items, okay? So this is where we are? That's it. Hey, look at the grounds. This is where everybody's supposed to be, but we're grateful. Remember, our children come first. Do not, this thing is about undefeated. That's right. Right. That's and when right. our and we're president not chose this thing, that's right. Us. Not no. gonna do, not, not gonna defeat us. Ministry. Not gonna defeat us. And so we want everybody, remember, even though we have 13, 14 ministries in youth ministry, please remember our children in these three. Pathfinders, Adventures. Adventurers, and our teens, TLT we just started, right? right? We just got our TLTs, but and our master guides, okay? Everybody, just continue to pray for us. Make sure our ministries will always be at the top. God bless you. Real good.
I found a friend indeed, and he is dear to me. When the road is rough and the going gets tough, he's there consistently. He'll never leave my side. On him I can rely. I found a friend indeed, and he is all to. Me. His name is Jesus, precious Jesus. He is my closest friend. On him I can always depend. He'll never leave my side. On him I can rely. I've found a friend indeed, and he. I found a friend indeed, and he is dear to me. When the road gets rough and the going gets tough, he's there consistently. He'll never leave my side. On him I can rely. I found a friend indeed, and he is all to me. His name is Jesus, precious Jesus. He is my closest friend. On him I can always depend. He'll never leave my side. On him I can rely. I've found a friend indeed, and he is all to me. His name is Jesus, precious Jesus. He is my closest friend. On him I can always depend. He'll never leave my side. On him I can rely. I've found a friend in Jesus. I. I found a friend indeed, and he is all to me. What's up, Allegheny East Conference? Good morning to you. You are alive. You are awake. You are breathing. Hopefully, you are smiling because God is awesome. I want to welcome you this morning to Allegheny East Conference virtual cat meeting with our youth and young adults. Once again, a special thank you to my boy and my friend, my brother from another mother, your youth director, one of the best youth directors around this um country and in this work, Pastor Patrick Graham. Now today we're going to dive straight into the Word of God. So if you have your Bibles, whether it is digital, whether it is physical, whether you're in the cubicle, whether you're on the move, the bus, the train, or you are in your bed enjoying an early summer break, I want you to take your Bible with you. I want you to take your Bibles with me, actually, and I want you to turn to the book of Genesis chapter 22 as we stay all the way up in this Word. We're going to stay up in this word this week, y'all, all right, because we are undefeated. That's right. That's our theme for the week, undefeated. So we're looking at Genesis chapter 22, and we're going to start from verse 1. Are y'all still with me? All right, all right. So we're starting once again in verse 1, and check out what the Bible says. It says, now, now it came about after these things that God tested. He what? That's right, y'all. I heard you. He, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he responded, here I am. He said, take now your son, 
your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I tell you. He goes on to say, early in the morning, Abraham saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. And he split wood for burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God told him. And the Bible says on the third day that Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Abraham said to the young man, stay here with the donkey and I and the lad will go over there and we will worship and return to you. And the Bible says Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked together. It actually continues and says that Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father. And he said, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. And he said, behold the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And so the two of them walked together. Let's pray, y'all. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you. For this morning word, we pray that you speak life over our lives, speak positivity over our day. And Father, we pray in a special way that someone know that they can and they will be simply because you are. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Hey, y'all, let, let's talk for a quick second. Uh, we know that Abraham and Isaac are facing some problems. All right. The truth is, is, is Abraham and his wife, Sarah, are trying to have children but for some reason, it's not working out. It's not working out no matter how hard they try, no matter what specialist they see, no matter what hospital they visit, no matter what uh, insurance plan, Blue Cross or, or Blue Shield or whatever it's called, it's not working out. And all they know is Abraham has tried to make things work out. But let me tell you something, man. You can never go ahead of God. When we go ahead of God, we move ahead of his plan. Are y'all hearing me? And so the Bible says, God finally blesses Abraham and Sarah with a son named Isaac. Then God says something that would be viewed as cray cray in the 21st century. God tells Abraham that he wants him to sacrifice not just his son, but he wants him to sacrifice his only son. What does that mean? Let me tell you something. God knew if he told Abraham to sacrifice his son, he was going to sacrifice the son he had with someone else because he stepped ahead of God. However, God knew that he wanted him to give up Isaac. So God said, take your son, your only son, the son that's part of my plan. He says, now I want you to offer him on the mountain of which I tell you. Now let me tell you something. For three days, Abraham struggles with this. Let me tell you something. This is the first time that God asked Abraham to do something. And this is the first time in the Bible that God asked Abraham to do something and he doesn't actually give him a promise. Are you all hearing me? And, and the reason why I'm telling you this is because Abraham is struggling in this text. Abraham knows that he know Abraham knows that God knows him. But he's trying to figure out if he knows God. And, and, and I want to ask you a question. Are you willing to follow God even when things don't make sense? Check this out. Youth and young adults, there are moments when we are going through our day and God asks us to do something. And sometimes we just can't put our finger on it simply because it doesn't make sense. And what I came to tell you in this place is that it's our job. If you want to be undefeated, if you want to be someone who is uh, someone who walks with God and someone who's able to really truly say that God showed up and did what he had to do. Let me tell you something. You have got to make sure that you follow God, even when you don't have the blueprint, even when you don't know how things are going to end up, even if you don't know if you're going to get the job you want, get into the school you asked for, get the money and the bank, have the bank that you want to have, even if you don't know the end. God is asking you to still follow him. And I'm challenging some youth and young adults. Are you willing to follow God even if God asks you to end the relationship? Are you willing to follow God even if maybe you couldn't get the job that you wanted because you have to be willing to choose to stay with God on the Sabbath? Are you willing to follow God even if you collected enough money 
to save up for that car, but you forgot you got to pay your tithe. Are you willing to still follow God? And I want to challenge Allegheny East Conference. The key to walking with God is learning that sometimes we don't know what's coming up next, but we still have to follow God all the way. All right? And so God tells Abraham to sacrifice his son. Let me tell you something. I can only imagine that Abraham thought he was losing his mind. But the Bible says after three days, he finally saddles his donkey and he takes two of his servants with him. And the Bible says that he goes to the place of which God tells him. And when he gets to the place of which God tells him, there are three things that Abraham does that I want to set the tone for our day. Number one, he tells his servants, stay here. Did you all hear me? Okay, let me tell you something. There are some people who can't go where you are going. Matter of fact, I'm going to be more specific. There are some people, if you keep them around, they're going to prevent you from getting where God wants you to go. And what I'm challenging you today is to do what Abraham did. Abraham knew that these two individuals were going to get in the way of God, what God was telling him to do. So he drew a line in the stand and he told these servants to stay here. There are some people in our lives who we've got to decide as we walk out of this pandemic and we enter into a post-pandemic world, there are some people who can't go with us. Are y'all hearing me? Everyone is not a part of God's plan in your life. And we've got to be willing to have the boldness, to have the security, to have the assurance, to have the mentality, to have the ideology, to have to declare and decide in our minds that guess what? You're not coming with me another day, not a moment, not another mile, because I've got to make sure I end up where God wants me. There are some people who you need to text, stay here, all right? There are some Facebook friends, you got to write, stay here. There are some TikTok moves, you got to suggest to people to tell people, you got to stay here. There are, there's someone you got to call and you got to say, stay here. There are some people in our lives, a stay, uh, stay here moment means that we reevaluate the relationships and friendships that we have and the people who are no good for us and the people who are going to sidetrack us from God's plan, we're going to decide we're going to stay here. Someone needs to say that you are on the way to work right now, you are on the train. When you get up to the surface and you get Wi-Fi, you need to tell them to stay here. There's somebody before, before you finish your workday, when you get to lunch, you need to text somebody, stay here. There's someone who your relationship is not working for you. It's not placing you in the will of God and you've got to decide in your mind, yes, I love him or her, but I'm not losing the kingdom over you. And so you've got to decide to say the words, stay here, stay here, stay here. Let me tell you something. Abraham says to his disciples, he says, stay here. And then he goes on to say, he says, we'll be back. Did you all hear me? He said, we'll be back because we are going to worship. And let me tell you something. When I heard the words, we'll be back, I initially thought that Abraham was a liar. I said, this, may, this patriarch in the Bible, this awesome man of God, man, how could he lie to the servants and say the words, we'll be back? I figured maybe he told them that so that they could stay there and not get in the way of him uh, uh, sacrificing Isaac. But then I realized something. The reason why Abraham was able to climb up on the mountain and go further to prepare to sacrifice his son was because Abraham knew if God asked him to give up something, then God was willing to give him something better. Did you all hear me? What that means is, is if God was asking him to sacrifice Isaac, God had the power to raise him back up because Isaac said the words in the text to these two young men will be back. In essence, he knew that if God was asking him to give up Isaac, God was going to have to raise him back up. So he said the words, we'll be back. Here's what you need to know as you go throughout this day. Check this out. If God asks you to tell someone or something to stay here, guess what? God has better for you. If God asks you to give up something or to sacrifice something or to walk away from something or to choose him over everything in your life, it's because God has better. Touch yourself and say, God has better. This is the security that someone needs to know that you can move forward 
You can stay the course. You can walk with God. You can live out your purpose and your destiny, Allegheny East Conference youth and young adults, because God has better. God has better. He has better. He has more. God has better. So don't be afraid to do it. He says, because we are going to worship. Let me tell you something. This morning, as we are in this opportunity for worship, there are some people who have the wrong idea of what worship is. Check this out. This is the first time in the Bible that worship is actually mentioned. Before this moment, worship is never mentioned. It's the first time. And check this out. The first time that the word worship is mentioned in the Bible in Genesis chapter 22 with Abraham and Isaac, check this out. There are no drums. There is no piano. There is no praise team. Y'all didn't hear what I said. There's no sanctuary. Are y'all listening to me? There is no church building yet. And still there is worship. Why? God was showing us that one of the most important parts of worship is not just what we do, but it's about what we give. Did y'all hear me? In essence, it's not just about what we receive, but it's also about what we give. When we give sacrificially to God, which means we are willing to give until it hurts, which means we are willing to give until it makes us uncomfortable. I, I'm hoping and praying that we have some radical worshipers in here. And radical worshipers don't mean that you can stand up and raise hands and shout. Radical worshipers are people who are willing to give God your best. Are you hearing me? And the best I'm talking about is not just what you put in an offering plate or in a tithe envelope, but the best we can give God is all of us. Are you willing today, while you are on your way to work, while you are on your way to school, while you are lying in your bed this morning, to give God everything you got? Are you willing to give God your all? I want to tell you something. I wondered, while Abraham was on this mountain, getting ready to sacrifice his son Isaac, how in the world did Abraham find the strength? And I want to tell you a quick story why Abraham found the strength and how Abraham found the strength to do what he needed to do. And I may have shared this during one of the Allegheny East Conference morning staff devotions, but y'all gonna hear this story again, if y'all don't mind. Let me tell you something. Uh, I remember a few years ago, I had invited a preacher to come speak at my church. This was when I was pastoring in my first district. And I remember uh, uh, we got through the weekend. It was Sunday morning. I was getting ready to take the preacher back to Chicago O'Hare Airport. But just before we were going to board a flight and head to the airport, let me tell you something. We decided to go to the only place you go on Sunday morning for good Sunday morning breakfast, and that is Cracker Barrel. Do y'all know anything about Cracker Barrel, Allegheny East Conference? If you do, let me know in the chat section. Let me tell you something. Uh, we went to Cracker Barrel and Y'all know Sunday mornings, it's packed at Cracker Barrel. I told them my name was Henry. They gave me buzzer number seven. Uh, they said, we're going to call you in about 45 minutes to an hour. And so we decided to do what's the only thing you do when you're waiting for breakfast at Cracker Barrel. And that's to play checkers out on the porch in the rocking chairs. And so I'm sitting in the rocking chairs with my boy, the pastor, the fellow preacher. We're playing checkers. Our wives are with us. And let me tell you something. While we're playing the game of checkers, I need you to understand, uh, uh, I find myself a very good checker player. But for some reason that morning, he was whipping me in the game of checkers. Understand, he had most of my pieces. I had the red pieces. He had the black pieces. And he had most of my pieces. I was losing. And, and, and I began to get nervous. Why? Because while we were playing the game of checkers, it began to rain outside. And everyone from the outside began to come on the inside. And when they got on the inside, they began to watch us play this game of checkers. And while we played this game of checkers, everyone's watching. My wife is nudging me, telling me I'm better win this game of checkers. I paused for a moment and I began to pray in my head because we can pray about anything. I began to tell God, I need you to show up in this game of checkers and help your manservant Abraham to win this game of checkers. And while I'm playing this game of checkers, eventually, eventually, that's why we are playing. He has most of my pieces. I'm down and he's up. He's winning. He's on top. I'm on the bottom. I'm trying to figure out and strategize. Eventually our buzzers go off. We wound up going to the table, and I began to walk to the table with my head held high. I need you to understand while he began and we began to butter our biscuits with the apple cinnamon butter at our table, I began to smile, and I was smiling so hard because the preacher turned to me and asked me a question. He said, how in the world 
did you win that game of checkers? That's right. I came to tell y'all I won that game of checkers. And he began to ask, how did you win the game of checkers? He said, "I, you had red pieces. I had black pieces. You were up and I was down. Uh, uh, you uh, were behind and I was ahead. And he began to say all those things. And he waited for my answer. And I told him, I said, preacher, you were right. I said, you were up and I was down. You had most of my pieces. I said, you, were, you out-strategized me, but I said, you missed something in the game. He said, what did I miss in the game? I said, if you looked and paid attention, you would have noticed, even though you had most of my pieces, even though you had your black pieces and most of my red pieces, the one thing you missed as to why I won was I had a king in my corner. Did y'all hear what I just said? I said I had a king in my corner. I won the game of checkers because I had a king in my corner. And the reason why Abraham knew he could sacrifice Isaac was because he had a king in his corner. And out of Guinea East, I came to tell you that you are unstoppable and you are undefeated because you've got a king in your corner. If you don't have anyone else on your side, if you don't have the right connections and know the right people and have the right job and have the right credit score and have the right phone number and, and live in the right zip code and area code. I need you to know something, even if you don't have the right degrees. Let me tell you something. Even if you don't have the right rap sheet, let me tell you something. You have God on your side. You've got a king in your corner. And if you've got a king in your corner, there is nothing you can't do without God. And so you go for it today. And know that you are undefeated and unstoppable. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for these few moments that we had where you broke and spoke a word out of us. The same way you were able to stop Abraham from sacrificing Isaac because you provided a replacement with a sacrificial lamb. God, I thank you for taking our place and putting Jesus there to die for our sins. And the reason why we're undefeated is not because we're smart. It's not because we're positioned. It's not because of who we know. But we are undefeated because of Jesus in our lives. We thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, we pray. Let everyone say amen. I pray you go with God today and have an awesome spiritual day.
Good morning, ladies. Welcome to Camp Meeting 2021. As usual, we are having our prayer breakfast. However, this year, we're not serving you temporal food. We're going to have a wonderful menu of spiritual food with a side dish of the wonderful worship thought. So this year, we're going to have an appetite of prayer and music. And then the main course is going to be a wonderful feast on the word of God as served by Chaplain Adrian Benton. With the, Now, the side dish will be your own choosing. And to finish the meal, you're going to enjoy the privilege of questions and answers with our presenter. And we're going to ask you to put those questions in the chat on Facebook or YouTube. And she will entertain them at the close of her presentation. And then to close, you're going to get a panoramic replay of the events and activities that you have enjoyed since our last breakfast. So again, I say, ladies, blessings on you. Welcome and enjoy this camp meeting. We hope you will feast well as we contemplate the privilege of being undefeated through the blood of Christ. Welcome. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited this morning about our women's ministry prayer breakfast. And at this time, we're just going to invite the presence of the Holy Spirit to come down upon us. Let's bow our heads at this time. Most kind and loving Father, we thank you, first of all, for a brand new day. We thank you for all the wonderful many gifts that you constantly bestow upon us. We invite the presence of your Holy Spirit to come down upon every viewer, everyone who will be participating in this program this morning. We ask a special anointing on our, on our presenter, Chaplain Adrian Benton. Pray, Lord, that you anoint her from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. 
Lord, you have used her in the past, and we know that today will be no exception. We pray that the words that she speaks will be coming to her through your Holy Spirit, and that hearts will be touched, souls will be blessed as a result of her ministry today. Be with the rest of our guests today. And Lord, at the end of this prayer breakfast, we will be careful to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. We love you and we thank you for hearing and answering this prayer. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Hello, ladies. I have the awesome privilege today of introducing our speaker of the hour. She is none other than Adrienne Townsend Benton. I'm sorry, Chaplain Adrienne Townsend Benton. Let me tell you a little bit about her. She's a dynamic international speaker and has inspired audiences with her spirit-filled messages of hope inspiration, and victory. She's an international speaker, trainer, and facilitator, and stands in awe of how God has called her to a non-traditional ministry to show how Christ is real and relevant to the living and lives of people of today. Chaplain Benton holds an associate's degree in early childhood, a bachelor's in elementary education and psychology, a master's in curriculum and instructions, and a master's of divinity degree from the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University. She also served as the associate dean of women on the campus of Andrews University and as an associate minister on the pastoral staff of Andrews University's New Life Seventh-day Adventist Fellowship. Adrian and her husband Theon reside in South Carolina and revel in the opportunity to bring hope and the light of Christ to precious souls that are in the dark corners of life. They count this as their mission and a privilege to embrace them daily. She is also a seasoned mentor, connector, and gifted international motivator, motivational speaker and has been since 2003. She is also a suicide prevention trainer and a spiritual resilience advocator. She is an Amazon bestseller author and workshop enthusiast, enthusiast. And she wrote this book, A Greater Force Than Failure, Intentional Time with God. I tell you, we are in for a treat. I have had the awesome privilege of meeting Chaplain Benton on various occasions. And when you meet her, it's as if you've known her for a lifetime. So I call her my friend. She may not even know my name, but I think she knows my face. But I am so happy to call her my friend. We are in such a, a delight today to have Chaplain Benton. So at the appointed time, hear ye, Chaplain Chaplain Adrian Townsend Benton. God will use her as he always does. We are in for a special treat from the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Oh, the day through. 
Jesus is reaching out to you. Is the life you're living filled with sorrow and despair? Does the future press you with its worry and its care? Are you tired and jealous? Have you almost lost your way? Jesus will help you just to walk to him today. He is always there. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. What a powerful message we have just received in the ministry of song. Reach out to Jesus, even now, right now, whether you're in your bed watching this, that's all right, no judgment. Whether you're in your kitchen cooking while you're watching this, go ahead and make that meal for, with the Lord's help. Whether you are in your car driving right now with your heart, just reach out to Jesus, yes. Whew. And as the song said, he's reaching out to you. Hallelujah. I want to say thank you first and foremost to your president of this illustrious conference, President Henry Fordham. Thank you to your women ministry leaders, Elder Cynthia Poole and Elder Penny Rogers for the invitation to join you this morning for the women's breakfast. I truly look forward to the day when we will be able to come together back in person. I'm, I'm already saying that I want to be with you, Sister Rogers. I'm looking forward to the opportunity to worship with you virtually. I'm to worship with you in person as we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Let's pray. Father, on this morning, we're grateful for these precious moments to allow our hearts and minds to be revived. As we focus on undefeated, we ask, Lord God, that you will speak deeply into our hearts. Speak now, for we are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Undefeated. <laughs> undefeated. As you came in contact with that title, what came to your mind? Undefeated. I can't. You can please do. Oh, I'm going to say that one more time. I can't. You can. Please do. This past week, from last week's Sunday to this week's Sunday, did you have any? I can't, Lord. Please. Lord, you can. I know you can. Please do moments. Did you, did you have any moments where everything within you was saying, I can't. I can't go on. I can't. I can't think anymore. I can't. I can't deal with this pain one more moment, but you can, Lord. Lord, I know you're more than able. Lord, I've seen you work miracles before. God, please do, do, Lord, because if you don't help me, Father, I don't know what I'm going to do. If you don't speak for me, God, I don't know what I'm going to say. If you don't, Lord God, I can't. You can. Please do. 
You know, the truth is that even as we're in this session right now, if someone were to ask you or I to use a word to describe the current movement in our emotions, the current movement in our physical, mental, or spiritual life right now, you and I would use words like, mm, I feel subtracted, I, I feel subdivided, I, I feel siphoned, or just plain stuck. Yeah, I know you can relate to that word. Stuck, stuck, stuck. How are you? I'm fine. That becomes the status quo response. You don't even think twice before the words come out of your mouth. I mean, Jackie, we have become so used to defining ourselves by what we perceive to be our accomplishments or our connections. Who am I apart from you? Who am I apart from it? Who am I apart from the family name, the, the group, the, the club, the fraternity, the church office? I mean, the children are grown, the house is empty. Who am I now? I've been a mother, a caretaker of a child in the house for 25 years. She's gone. Who am I outside of being a mother? The job decided they no longer need my service. Who am I now and where do I go from here? You might be saying, I don't understand all of the changes that are taking place in technology. I mean, Zoom and Instagram and Twitter. Lord, who am I? What is my purpose? You met and you dated your childhood sweetheart. You got married, supported your spouse's career. Two years before retirement, your spouse passes. Gone now. Yeah, gone are the plans for retirement. Shattered is the vision for the vacations and planting and tending the garden together. Alone, not by choice. Anybody alone in life right now? Anybody going through trials right now? Not by choice, but by the approved will of God. Who am I? I can't, you can, Lord, please do, because I feel so defeated. I can't, Lord, you can, so please do. I mean, right now I'm talking in this breakfast to the woman who woke up this morning singing, I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Yes, I'm talking to you right now. Joya, I'm talking to the woman that's struggling to let go of the worry, even as we strive on this morning to appreciate that God is God. Even while we are wondering, Lord, when are you going to show up for me in real time? We find ourselves at a crossroads. How am I supposed to get up from this stress and pressure? Lord, my mind is playing tricks on me. They tell me about self-care. When am I supposed to find the time between all the roles, roles of being a wife and role of being a mother and I'm a sister and I'm a boss, a lady boss at work. All these roles, I'm trying to be a church elder. Lord, how am I supposed to find the time? How am I supposed to, what, what, it, how am I supposed to live an, an, an undefeated life? I can't. You can. Please do. Turn with me to the book of Habakkuk in the Old Testament. Turn with me to the book of Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk chapter 3, we're going to look at verses 1 to 2. Habakkuk chapter three, verses one to two. There's a technique called Lectio Divina. Lectio Divina says that whenever you are looking to study a passage of scripture, very briefly, that what you do is you read that passage of scripture three times. The first time you read it just to simply familiarize yourself with it. The second time you read it to figure out what's the word or the phrase that you connect with. And the third time you read it, you read it and you say, Lord, what are you saying to me? So I'm gonna read it three times for you. The first time, so we simply get familiar. The second time, I'm going to invite you after I read it the second time to go ahead in the chat, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, go ahead in the chat and literally just put the word or the phrase that you connect with. And then the third time I read it as a community, I am going to invite every individual to go ahead and put in the chat, what is God saying to you this morning? The Bible says that we are overcome by the word of our testimony. So when you share what the Lord is saying to you, you will encourage someone who may be remotely far away from you around the world, but the Lord will use you. So let's begin. Lord, <laughs> I have heard of your fame. 
I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day, in our time. Make them known in wrath. Remember mercy. Mm. Hallelujah. I'm going to read it again. And this time I want you to just what word or what phrase in this passage scripture do you connect with and put it in the chat? Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day, in our time. Make them known in wrath. Remember mercy. Go ahead, put it in the chat. What word or what phrase instantly catches your attention? Some of you may say fame. Somebody may say in awe. Repeat them in our day in wrath. Remember mercy. Whatever it is, just go ahead and put it in the chat. And now this last time that I read it, I want you to open up your heart and your mind and say, Lord, speak to me. And then I want you to share after I read the verse, what is the Lord saying to you today? Lord. I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day, in our time. Make them known in wrath. Remember mercy. Hallelujah. What is God saying to you? What is God saying to you? What is God saying to you? Go ahead and be a digital evangelist and share that right now in the chat. Because you see, Sister Valerie, Micah, Nahum, and Habakkuk, minor prophets in the Old Testament. They were three representatives of God to Judah. In Micah, God's message to everyday people like you and me is God is moving. Ah, in Micah, God promises to act and intervene in human history. In Nahum, God's message to the Ninevites are, you are going. <laughs> you remember Jonah, right? Right there, God sends Jonah to comfort Judah that their longstanding enemy and tell them that their longstanding enemy is out of the way. And now here in Habakkuk, now here in Habakkuk, God speaks to clergy. God speaks to the prophet and shares the Babylonians are coming. If we had to give this uh, chapter, this book a uh, title, the message would be lead uh, in times of trouble. I'm going to say that one more time. Lead uh, in times of trouble. Habakkuk, his name means to embrace. And he earned that title by wrestling with God in the beginning of the book and by developing deep intimacy with God by the end of the book. I'm going to say that one more time because I know that I'm not the only one that's going through. And sometimes we need to be reminded that there's a purpose for our pain. Hey, God has a plan for our pain. Hey, God calls us to be patient with our pain. Yes, Habakkuk, his name means to embrace. And he earned that title by wrestling with God. When was the last time that you wrestled with God? You stayed in the fight instead of trying to quit and get out of the ring. And he got that name by wrestling with God in the beginning of the book and by developing deep intimacy. I said deep intimacy. That means spending time with God. I said deep intimacy. That means talking to God and praying with God and walking with God and driving with God and going to work with God and raising your children with God, deep intimacy with God by the end of the book. In Habakkuk, there are no easy answers. Habakkuk himself could have entitled this book, No Easy Answers, because right from chapter one, he begins with a question. Why are you allowing this? Have you ever said that to God? No. Oh, no. Matter of fact, when was the last time you said to God, maybe even this morning, when was the last time you said to God, God, why are you allowing this? In chapter one, Habakkuk says, how long? Woo, I can relate to this one. How long shall I cry out to you and you do not hear? God, how long will there be no more food in my refrigerator? How long will you allow my husband to be abusive? How long will I not be able to find a job that covers my bills at the end of the month? Habakkuk says, how long will I cry out and you not hear me? Mm, mm, mm. And he goes even further. He says, are you not everlasting? He says, are you not everlasting? Are you not the Holy One? Sometimes in this life, you go through circumstances, mama, and you're saying, God, why? Why am I suffering? Lord, why all this pain and heartache? 
Why is sin and evil and wickedness allowed to prosper? Who have mercy? I can't. You can. Mm, please do, Lord. Please do, Lord. Please do. You see, in chapter two, God responds to Habakkuk. Let me tell you, when you talk to God, when you pray, when you ask God a question, understand that God is not afraid of your questions. He's not afraid of any communication that you can give. Anything that you ask God, guess what? You're not the first person. And in chapter two, God responds to Habakkuk. <laughs> God responds. He says, you want to know? You have all these questions? Let me go ahead and give you the vision. God gives him a vision about his plan to rectify the situation by raising up Babylon to plunder and capture Judah in war. Uh-oh. <laughs> God gives him the vision his vision to rectify the situation by raising up Babylon to plunder and capture Judah in war. Now you need to recall, Habakkuk is writing about 18 to 20 years before Jerusalem is about to be destroyed in 586 BC. And we're told that King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon surrounded the city and besieged it for two years, starving the people of Judah into submission. Oh yeah, ever, have you ever had any circumstances where it seems like Satan is trying to starve you you into his submission, starve you from community, starve you from financial comfort and being able to take care of yourself, starve you from mental health causing you to, to, to step into the temptation of depression. Listen, they were starving the people of Judah, trying to control them and starve them into submission. And eventually the king of Judah and his army tried to escape through a hole in the wall at night, but they were caught and slaughtered. The Babylonian army entered the city, looting and murdering and plundering and destroying. And Habakkuk receives the vision. And how does Habakkuk respond to this vision? Ah, listen, 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 come close, come close, come close. You see, he presented God with what he thought was an integrity check. <laughs> he said, God, do you really know what you are doing here? <laughs> Again, have you ever asked that question? No, 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 I'm sorry. When was the last time you said to God, God, do you know what you're doing in my life? Because this, this, this don't make sense right here. I, I, I don't see any rainbow in the cloud. All I see is gloom and doom. Lord, Lord, what, what, what's going on? Habakkuk 3, 1 to 2. I'm going to read it one more time in your hearing. After receiving the vision, this is the prayer that Habakkuk writes. After receiving the vision for desolation and despair, this is the prayer that Habakkuk writes. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. Lord, repeat them in our day, in our time. Make them known in wrath. Remember mercy. I can't. I can't. Number one, I can't. Listen, you and I are being called to pray, Lord, I can't. But I know what you have already done. Ah, <laughs> I know what you have already done in my life. What has he already done? He woke you up this morning undefeated. He gave you food to eat undefeated. He gave you a place to stay undefeated. He gave you the ability to work undefeated. He forgave you of your sins undefeated. You go ahead and add the next thing that God has done for you undefeated. Come on now. Undefeated. Hallelujah. Undefeated. Thank you, Jesus. Undefeated. Number one, you say, I can't Lord, but I know what you have already done. Number two, you can, ah, Lord, you can. So Lord, I'm praying right now that you open my eyes so that I may see. Open my eyes so that I may see. Open my heart so that I can feel again. Open my brain so that I can think again. Open my mind so that I can choose again. God has created you and God has created me with the ability to choose, choose every minute. Within every second, you choose how you will live and what value you will give to your life and what behaviors you will manifest. God created you and me to be responsible beings. Our lives are not a facade. Our lives are not fake alternative moves, news. Stop trying 
to get others to fall in love with you, a you that you don't know, a you that you don't even love yourself, half studied, half work. It's time to finally grow. It's time to grow your whole self. It's time to let God really and truly lay himself down inside you. It's time for a reset, mother. It's time for a reset, grandmother. It's time for a reset, auntie. It's time for a reset, sister. What has God done already for you where God is saying right now, I'm calling you to live? You and I, you and I, yes, you and I were created in God's image to live and to lead, to live and to liberate, to live and to launch, to live and to leave a legacy, to live and to laugh, to live and to learn, to live and to be loving, to live and to listen, to live and to be loyal, to live and to love the Lord our God with all of your heart and with all of your mind and with all of your soul. Lord, I can't. Mm. You can, Jesus. Help me to live an undefeated life. And finally, Lord, please do. Mm. In verse two, Habakkuk says, in wrath, remember mercy. Ooh. Remember me, Lord. Listen, there's so much that's going on in this world. This is the time for you to say, Lord, remember me. Remember me, says, Lord, revive me. Revival says, Lord, cause an improvement in the condition of my life. Lord, cause an improvement in my strength and my energy. Revive. The word revival is from the Hebrew word kaya, and it means to bring back to life. Hallelujah. It means to restore to consciousness. Thank you, Jesus. It means to restore from a previous condition. Right now, cry out to God and say, Lord, bring my marriage back to life. Lord, restore my mind back to consciousness. Heavenly Father, restore my ability to be productive in society. Restore me back, Lord God, to my previous condition of being useful for you. Because when you and I succumb, when you and I stay strangled to the hurt and stay strangled to the pain and stay strangled to the sorrow and stay strangled to the disappointments of life, then you and I are not open and available to receive God's joy and to receive God's peace and to receive God's compassion and to receive God's energy and to receive the love of the Holy Spirit. You will find yourself walking through life as a robot, walking through life in a routine manner, walking through life being mechanical. And God is saying to you and to me, live, live, live and be excellent where life is calling you to serve right now. Love the skin that you're in. Love the husband that you have. Hug the children running around the house. Put on the clothes in your closet that fit. Don't wait to get a gym membership. Get outside and walk around your neighborhood right now. Shake off that depression. Wash your dishes. Search for a new online job. Send your resume. Apply for the scholarship. Write that book. Go back to school. Tutor the children in your community. Lord, revive. Lord, revive. Lord, revive me. Oh, Jesus. Because you see, at the end of uh, chapter three, in verses 17 to 18, Habakkuk says, after he has prayed several prayers, he says, though the fig tree does not bud, hallelujah, and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stall, yet, come on now with a yet praise, ah! <laughs> yet will I rejoice. Go ahead and lift up those hands. Yet will I rejoice. Go ahead and open up your mouth. Yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in my God. Yet will I rejoice. Come on now, take a moment and give God a yet I will rejoice. Praise, praise him, praise him. Jesus, our blessed redeemer. Hallelujah. Lord, we love you. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we magnify your name. You're our rock of ages. You are 
are our King of Kings. You are our Lord of Lords. Listen, God is our everything. And God knows that some of us are so stubborn that when we hear the word everything, we don't really understand what everything means. And so God gives us the opportunity to have it broken down where we can come to understand that God is a healer. He's my everything. God is a way maker. He's my everything. God is a doctor. He's my everything. God is a lawyer. He's my everything. God is bread when I'm hungry. He's my everything. Yet will I rejoice. Oh, the plan for our redemption was not an afterthought. No, it was very intentional. From the beginning, God and Christ knew. From the very beginning, God ordained that sin would not overwhelm us. This was because of his great love for not just the world, but for you, mama. This was because of his great love for you, auntie. This was because of his great love for you. So God is calling you and I even now to cry out like Habakkuk, Lord, I can't right now take all of your I can'ts and put it down before the throne of God. When this session is over, you may have to get a piece of paper and write down your list of I can't so that you can then put them before the throne of God in a manner that is specific. The Bible said, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. Lord, I can't. But Lord, you can go ahead and confess with your mouth everything that you already know about God and tell him, Lord, I know. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I worship you. Lord, you've been there for me. Father, go ahead and tell him what you know. And please do, God, please do supplicate yourself before the Lord and just release Let there be a total release where God truly has the ability to be your refuge and God truly has the ability to be your strength. Never again, never again will I confess that I can't for I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Never again will I lack. Never again will I confess lack because God will supply for all of my needs. Never again will I confess fear. For God hath not given me the spirit of fear, but of love and of a sound mind. Never again will I confess doubt because God has given to every man the measure of faith. Never again will I confess weakness for the Lord is the strength of my life. Never again will I confess supremacy to Satan for greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Never again will I confess defeat for God always causes me to triumph. Never again will I confess lack of wisdom for Christ is made unto me wisdom from God. Never again will I take hold and confess sickness for By his stripes, I am healed. Never again will I confess worry or frustration for I'm casting all of my cares upon God. Never again will I confess bondage for the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty. Never again will I confess condemnation for there is now no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Never again will I confess lowliness for lo, I am with you even until the end of the age. Never again. Well, I confess discontentment for I have learned uh, to be content uh, in whatever circumstances I am. Never again will I confess unworthiness because he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Never again will I confess. Come on now. Come on now with me and say never again. Go ahead and type it in the chat. Never again. Never again. Never again. Well, I confess confusion because God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Never again will I confess persecution. For if God be for me, hey, who can be against me? Never again will I confess insecurity because when you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet for the Lord will be your confidence. Never again will I confess failure. But in all these things, we are overwhelmingly conquerors through him who loved us never again will I confess frustration for you will keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you never again will I confess fear of the future but as it is written I have not seen ear have not heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him never again will I confess trouble because Jesus said these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may 
have peace in this world. Uh, you will have tribulation, but take heart, my sister, but take heart, mother, but take heart, auntie, but take heart, grandma, because Jesus said in John 16, 33, I have overcome the world. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ. The solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Today, the Lord is calling for you and I to live an undefeated life through the power of God. Cry out to the Lord when you're feeling desperate. Cry out to the Lord when you're laughing and when you're crying, but cry out to the Lord when the world is coming and trying to overtake you and just say, Lord, I can't. You can, please do. Let's pray. Father, right now, we just want to thank you. We thank you for these moments, Lord, these brief moments to just come into your presence and to allow ourselves to have a surrendered heart. You have heard the message that we have received today. I pray even now, Lord, that you will move in a powerful manner, that you will break the chains that are binding our heart, that you will cause us to be totally surrendered. May we always stay cognizant of what you have already done, Lord. May we stay cognizant of our need for you. Hide us behind the cross. And we're asking God in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you will hear our cry as we say, Lord, I can't. Lord, you can. So Lord, please do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bless you, Chaplain Benton. Bless you. Bless you as you have blessed our souls. Ladies, this is the time where if you have those burning questions, we want you to put them in the chat, Facebook, YouTube chat, and we are going to uh, ask Chaplain Benton to address them uh, to the best of her ability. But ladies, while you are thinking of your questions, I'm going to ask Chaplain Benton, if you would please share with us just some practical points on how we can stay, you know, how we can manage and maneuver in this time frame to be undefeated. How do we come to that state? Mm, I love that question. So I call them the four P's. Number one, we have to start with prayer. It is so important, ladies, that we really continue to be intentional with, with maintaining and staying in relationship with God. There's so many things that come at us. There's so many responsibilities that we have that you will be overwhelmed by life if you're trying to do this on your own. But it's only the strength and the grace of God through prayer that fortifies us. Number two, pause. It's so important that we take time to just be still. We're so used to run, 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 run all the time. And many times God is trying to talk to us, but we're moving so fast that we can't hear him. It's important for us to pause so that our mind, our heart, our spirit can run rest. Pivot. When God speaks to us, it is so important that we are obedient to what he's telling us, to how he's telling us to move forward, even if we don't understand the next step, even if it feels like it's just so risky or it's causing us to be humble. God knows what he's doing with our lives. So be intentional with pivot, letting God move you forward. And then number four is practice. It's important that we don't just study the word of God, that we don't just be in relationship, but that we're willing to live this out as a lifestyle. Understand that in the midst of your sacrifices and your challenges, as you are being in relationship with God, God is literally using your life. You don't, you may never be aware, but God will literally use your light to be a shining light to the world where others will be able to see what it looks like to serve God in the midst of your problems, trusting that he is more than able and know that as God delivers you, you will have a testimony. You will be able to say, I am amongst the redeemed in the name of Jesus. So pray, pause, pivot, and practice. Okay. I heard you mention, um, you talked about us having a vision. Mm -hmm. How do we recognize when God is trying to give us a vision for our, the vision that he has for us. Mm. How, do we, how do we recognize that? I love that. So number one, it goes back to being intentional about telling God, God, I am open. 
It's bit about being intentional with putting uh, putting to the side your own desires. God knows the desires of your heart. Many times when God is giving us a vision, he doesn't just give it to you one time and then it just passes and never comes back. No, that vision will come to the forefront of your mind. It will come to you in multiple ways. When you recognize that God keeps on giving you opportunities to work with disadvantaged children, he keeps on putting it in front of you, whether it's through a commercial on TV or whether L dependent calls you and gives you an opportunity to volunteer or whether you walk down a street and a little child came up and tugged on your jacket and said, hi, can you help me? Like God will keep on putting it in front of you. You will know in your heart. Many times we don't like to admit, but in our inner core, we know, oh, God's trying to tell me something and it's being open, willing to receive the vision and then let God, let God do the next steps. He'll move you. Okay, our next question comes from YouTube. And um, someone wants to know, how do we encourage caregivers to release their burden of fear as they are caring for family members? Mm, and that's so real. It, it, being a caregiver, it is not easy in any way, shape, or form. You have your own life, but you're very tied and committed to taking care of whoever this loved one is. Number one, I'm going to go back to prayer. Listen, this is not about being super spiritual, right? But really and truly, we cannot do anything on our own strength. Caregivers, you have got to go to God when you wake up in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening time. Lord, I'm giving this day to you. I'm giving my mother to you. I don't know how to care for her like you do, Lord. I'm asking you to fill in the missing pieces. It's my mom is heavy when it's time to go pick her up and take her to the bathroom. I'm asking you to get in my back. I'm asking you to get in my legs. Give me that supernatural strength in the name of Jesus. Lord, cause me to be able to take care of mom with joy. Whatever it is that caused me to be upset and resentful that I'm the one in the family that has to take care of mom all by myself, I'm asking you to, like, this is, has to be a daily incessant. Listen, God wants to bless you more than you want him to bless you. He also wants you to be intentional about casting everything, giving him everything. That way you get out of the way. And finally, understand this. In order for the miraculous to take place, the miraculous has to begin from a position of difficulty. If you can do it, it ceases to be a miracle. So when the, 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 the difficulty comes, don't get frustrated. Don't settle in anxiety. All right, God, what you going to do here? So the caregivers put it back in God's hands and ask God how he wants to take care of your loved one and let him fill in the gaps. Okay. All right. Well, we don't have any more questions from Facebook. And I believe that we have utilized our questions from YouTube. So Chaplain Benton, we can't thank you enough for this delicious meal. You've given us not only a breakfast, you've given us an appetizer, you've given us the main course, you've given us dessert, and you we followed up with the sherbet to clean our palates, and you keep on serving and serving. So we thank you for this wonderful, wonderful presentation. And yes, Keep your eyes open when you see that Allegheny East Conference email coming to you. Be sure to open it because we will be calling you again. Uh, ladies, we thank you. And now we're going to turn it over to Sister Penny, who is going to share with us some of the wonderful things that have been going on since the pandemic. Chaplain Benton. Blessings on your ministry and God go with you. Amen, amen. Undefeated. I can't, you can, please do, Lord. Wow, that was powerful. The phrase I connected with was in wrath, remember mercy. And the takeaway that I got from it was there's a purpose for our pain. Oh, God won't bring you to it without bringing you through it. Praise the Lord. Speaking of undefeated, despite this pandemic, we have not missed a beat in ministry. 
We thank God for social media that has allowed us to reach more individuals than we could have reached just sitting in our churches. The area leaders, AEC area leaders, advisors, and women ministry leaders of our churches of the Great Allegheny East Conference have been working hard in the ministry, reaching individuals and uplifting and empowering women during this difficult time. So with no further ado, I would like to share a PowerPoint presentation with you of all the events and programs that we have been doing during this pandemic. Okay, give me a minute here. Sorry, I had it up, one second. Ladies, Christ's amazing love moves us to minister to others. Let me share with you at this time. Baltimore, D.C. Metro. And as you look at these events, I'm sure most of you will remember attending some of these events and being involved in these events. We had the first Friday prayer call, April 3rd, 2020. You know, this is right at the beginning of the pandemic because the pandemic started in March, 2020. A virtual slumber party happened on a Saturday night. These ladies have been really, really busy. And these are some of the events that took place while they were doing the slumber party to pick up the ladies and games and laughter, things that we need during this time. On May 9th and 10th, we had the modern day virtuous woman. This was a weekend event. We move on we, and you're gonna see that there's all types of different ministries that were going on during this pandemic. Here we have a community festival that took place. Free school supplies, free backpacks and everything were given out to the students. Oh, I love this one. This was a pull up and praise service <laughs> where you drive through and receive praise. I'm telling you, we have gotten very creative during this time of this pandemic. And when you look at all the different um, events and ministries that we have been doing during this time, you can see the creativity coming out. For such a time as this, our New Life SDA Church presented this for their Women's Day to Pastor Janelle Moore Monroe. Then we had a virtual weekend event that had all these powerful women of God speaking. And as you can see, you see their faces and you see um, their names. Beautiful. Fall in love with baking class. Now, this kind of reminded me of our fall series, Cynthia. <laughs> we had a fallen in love with, with Jesus series uh, last year during the pandemic. And when I saw this fall in love with baking class, it reminded me of our fall series. We had discussions regarding COVID. Here we have Dr. Gina Brown and Dr. Terrence Fuller doing a discussion on regarding COVID-19 vaccinations for the community. Oh, women on fire. Now look at all these mighty women of God here. <laughs> Brenda Pillar was the host. And then you had all these mighty women of God presenting during this time. Praise the Lord. Helpful women and girls. This was a, another giveaway drive for women. 
And here we have valiant women. This was the DuPont Park Seventh-day Adventist Church. Here we have Women's First Friday's Prayer Call. This one took place earlier this year, January 1st, right on the New Year's Day. So they was right on it, right at the beginning of the year, offering encouragement and praise and prayer to the women. This ministry is called Chosen Vessels. Our Women's First Friday Prayer Call, the special guest was Brenda Pillar. And here we have a special guest, Pastor Lisa Smith-Reed and Dr. Gina Brown. And last but certainly not least, we had Dr. Kesslin B. Stennis. This series was called Speak, Lord. Here we had a diaper hub, a free diaper giveaway. So you see, we have really, really been looking at the needs of the women during this pandemic and providing all the needs of the community. Praise the Lord. Here's another one. This one was food items that was donated to families in need. And they did this every fourth Sunday of the month from the 4th Street Friendship SDA Church. Praise the Lord. Virginia Bay, South Jersey. Oh, look at this. International Day of Prayer. Now look how close to the pandemic. This, the pandemic started right around this time, March 2020. And this church did not hesitate to get started right on their social media ministry. Virtuous living in an unvirtuous world. Praise the Lord. We have our special guest, Augusta O'Lori, and the afternoon seminar for young ladies becoming enough for young ladies 10 to 17. This was out of our Newtonville Seventh-day Adventist Church with our South Jersey area leader, Betty Mason. Betty Mason's church in Newtonville also had an End It Now panel discussion. They had a morning service geared toward End It Now, Emphasis Day, Breaking the Silence. And then they did a panel discussion in the afternoon entitled Love Shouldn't Hurt. I was actually on that panel discussion. It was very powerful. Cynthia and I both attended. There's a little short video clip here that I want to show you for end it now. I want to make sure I do this right because I know I got to share my music. Can you guys hear it? Okay, because I think I had to share my music ahead of time. So I'm going to skip that. I'm going to keep going. Okay, Bay Area Women's Ministries, Steady As She Goes. This was prayer calls. They had it on specific days of the week and then individual prayer days. Ten days of fasting and prayer. And you know the word of God tells us in Matthew 17, 21, but this kind go without saying not out saved by fasting and by prayer. Some things require fasting and prayer. Women in the Word, March Gladness. And we have two instances of this happening. We have these dates here, and then it continued on. March Gladness, Women in the Word. The Waiting Room. I don't know, I remember this one particularly, um, the waiting room. And you know, sometimes it's hard to wait on the Lord, but the word of God admonishes us to wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen our hearts. Wait, I say, on the Lord. So this waiting room experience was really a nice experience for those of you who had a chance to attend it. It was very powerful, very uplifting, and very inspiring. And our Bay Area leader, Jackie Woolley, along with our uh, Bay Area advisor, Tina Smith, led out in this endeavor. This is another one that was led out by uh, Jackie Rooley. Lay aside what hinders you, 10 days of fasting and prayer. Northern New Jersey, Delaware Valley. I actually participated in this particular ministry. It was a one day of prayer. Oh, it was very powerful. 
Uh, so for those that had a chance to be on for the whole time, for the one day of prayer, you truly received a rich blessing. Now, Cynthia and I was busy too <laughs> with our AEC sponsored events. Cynthia and I spoke and we said, what can we do for the women? You know, we're in a pandemic, you know, we can't have the prayer breakfast live and we can't do certain things live. So we started putting our heads together and Cynthia and I came up with some great ideals for ministry. Our first tea party series that happened in April of 2020, fresh right out when the pandemic first started, my cup running over. And we had different presenters speak on these eight different topics right here because we felt like these were the topics that was most relevant for what people were going through, especially in the midst of a pandemic. And then we had our Fallen in Love series. Our Fallen in Love series, we use all our, our female pastors, Novella Smith, Marlena Debro, Sherry Hall, and Lisa Smith-Reed. And this series was all about being like Christ in our words, actions, and deeds. So we know the two greatest commandments is you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That's the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So this Fallen in Love series was all about learning to be like Jesus through forgiveness, loving people like Jesus do, and being a true servant leader. If you didn't get a chance to attend it, you surely really missed the blessing. Cynthia and I, this was our first time doing this. 10 days of prayer. Now I've done it with um, individual churches. My church did it, but it was so empowering to be able to do it as a conference. And when Cynthia and I went, sat down and looked at all our events for the year, we said, we should host this 10 days of prayer. And I mean, it was powerful. 10 days of prayers, uplifting, empowering uh, messages. It truly was a blessing. Then we had our tea party for this year, and these were our presenters, and they presented on stress, help for grief and depression, financial advice for tough times and visions of hope. And then that brings us to where we are now, ladies. Right now, the prayer breakfast we just had. And at this point, I'm, gonna, I'm almost done this. This is our upcoming fall series, ladies. So put this on your calendars. This will take place September 12th through October 3rd at 1 p.m. This is our summer series, Leave It to God. So stay tuned for more information regarding that. God needs women like you. Women who are fully surrendered to him. Women who love him and are willing to give their lives as a sacrifice of praise to God, women who will put God first in all things. That means before everybody and everything. Women who are studying God's word and are lead, being led by the Holy Spirit and women who are willing to serve others. And I'm telling you, we have those women. We have those women in the Allegheny East Conference. We have those area leaders, those advisors, those women ministry leaders who truly care about the constituents of the Allegheny East Conference. And so ladies, we thank you. Now, last but not least, we wanna support our presenter, <laughs> Adrian Benton, Chaplain Adrian Benton. She has a book, A Greater Force Than Fail Failure. To order this book, you could go to amazon.com or you could go to forwardmomentministries.org. We thank you, ladies, for your ministry, for your commitment, for your dedication. And I will now do my closing remarks, and then we will end with prayer. We invite you to come back and join us tomorrow at 3 p.m. for our Cooking with Soul series. We thank you for joining us today. God bless each and every one of you. Continue to be encouraged in the Lord. God bless you. Thank you. Let us reverently bow our heads in prayer and go to the throne of grace. Our most gracious God, our Father, our Redeemer, Lord, we're so thankful 
that you allowed us to feast at your table today. And Lord, our, my prayer is that this food will flow throughout our veins, our bodies, our blood, Lord, that it will become a part of our lives. And Lord, as we go out and share with others, that they will know that we have been with you. I pray, Lord, for those who are sick, those who may be shut in, Lord, those who are going through bereavement at this time. I ask, oh God, that you will put your arms around them. And most of all, Lord, that you will help us to hold on and to run this race because we know at the end, Lord, that you have the prize. So we thank you, Lord, for blessing us today. In your name we do pray and thank thee. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.